someone muted me. <laughs> or maybe I muted me, or maybe the ghost that caused me to go offline earlier muted me. But um, anyway, Kenva, I assume you can hear me now. Yes, sir. <laughs> I can hear you now. <laughs> I was muted, and I have no idea why I was muted. I did not mean to be muted. So I think it's I think it's good that if I was going to be not recording, that uh, not recording for the review of what we did last week is probably the best <laughs> the best thing to be muted for. Um, I heard everything. What's that? I heard everything. Okay, I I don't know what was going on because when I looked at my mic, it was muted, so I understood what. Canvas problem was, but I don't know why. Why why you were able to hear me? I like I say. I think there's. I think we've got gremlins or ghosts in the system tonight. So uh, no telling what's going to happen. But anyway, again, I emphasize the and the 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 principal idea is very important. I believe it's. I think it's the key. It it's. It's the key to understanding how all of Scripture, everything in Scripture, um, can apply to us and should apply to us. If you do, if you don't go with that idea of principle, then you're going to have a lot of problems applying a lot of things in Scripture. But but the idea that everything everything applies in principle. Um, I think is extremely important and, and extremely helpful to us, and and um, especially when we get back in some of the details of the law and so on, um, which obviously, well, should be obvious, doesn't um, doesn't apply to us directly. Even people who try to say all the law applies to us really can't, they can't do it because there are just too many, there, there are too many, too many things having to do with the law that, I mean, for instance, why would we, why would we offer sacrifices today? Um, but in principle, we still offer sacrifices, sacrifice of praise, sacrifice ourselves as a living uh, sacrifice and so on. Um, so, so the principle is very important. Okay, enough of step three. Step four, now we, we're grasping the text in our town. Step four, grasp the text in our town. The question for this step is, how would, or how should rather, individual Christians apply the theological principle in their lives? How should individual Christians apply the theological principle in their lives? While there are only a few, sometimes only one, theological principle in a passage, there will be a whole variety of ways that that might be applied for Christians today. Each of us will grasp and apply the same theological principle, but we'll do it in somewhat different ways because we're different people in different situations. And so sometimes we, we will see this principle and we'll think, ooh, that applies to my, uh, the situ my home life, or that applies to my job, or that applies to my friendships, or that applies to my relationship to enemies. And, and since we're unique and our situation is unique, those, the applications of those will be slightly different. Um, but again, there's only going to be, well, one principle, I'll put it this way, one principle can have many applications. There's a little saying that some of you may have heard, it actually has to do with methods, but it applies to this. Methods are many, principles are few. Methods always change, principles never do. And I think that, that sums it up pretty well. You could 
you could actually substitute the word uh, application for the word method there. But the idea is a principle may be applied either as a method or application in, in your own individual life in a, in a variety of ways, depending on your situation. I'm hearing somebody, but I'm not hearing it clearly. Oh, I'll state it again. Methods are many. Principles are few. Methods always change. Principles never do. And see, we get back to the timelessness of the principle, but the applications may change. Not only are there many of them for one principle, but also they change over time. And, um, but let, let's look at some um, examples, and this will also, some of these will, well, these will also illustrate the idea of principle. Uh, for one of this, we'll go to Genesis. In Genesis 12, God calls a man by the name of Abram. For, in the first 11 chapters of Genesis, as the background to that, in the first 11 chapters of Genesis, you have creation in chapters 1 and 2. You have the fall in chapter 3. And then in chapters 4 through 11, we see that things go from bad to worse. Sin doesn't, I mean, at the beginning... Adam and Eve sinned by disobeying the prohibition to eat of the tree. Um, and that's bad, but things got worse after that. They have two sons. One son murdered the other one. And, I mean, it just, there's a whole series of these terrible things. At one point, God says, I'll just wipe the whole thing out and start over again. So he chooses the best one. Uh, Noah to save him and his family and wipe everything else out, cleanse the world with water, and, and go on. But Noah gets off the boat and sin starts all over again. And uh, so in chapter 12, God, after having illustrated through the behavior of human beings that human beings are unable to save themselves, he then steps in in chapter 12, and he calls a man by the name of Abram, and he makes certain promises to Abram, including that he will make Abram into a great nation, and that all people on earth will be blessed through him. Okay, that's a promise to Abram. Abram is old and has no children. God promises him a son, but he and his wife are from a human standpoint, too old to have children. But God promises. Eventually, after a long time to, for Abraham to, uh, to exercise his faith, and at which time Sarah becomes impatient and makes a big mistake that, that has ramifications from then on, Anyway, eventually, Abram and Sarah have a, have a son by the name of Isaac. In Genesis 22, and that's all the background to this, in Genesis 22, God comes to, to Abraham and he says, I want you to take your son, your only son, whom you love, and I want you to take him to Mount Moriah, and in one of the mountains there, I want you to sacrifice him to me. And we are not told what Abraham thought. We are not taught what we are not told what he felt. And yet, in what God said, it's implied. Why, what other reason is there for God to say, "I want you to take your son, your only son"? Abraham knew that was his only son, but God is emphasizing, "I want you to take your son, your only son, whom you love." and sacrificing. And so any parent should be able to 
feel that. And but on top of everything else, this is the son of promise. God had promised to make Abraham into a great nation and to bless all people on earth through him. How's that going to happen now that he's going to sacrifice his, his son? So there's got to be some confusion and heartbreak. But all it says is that the next morning Abraham gets up and he takes Isaac and he takes their servants and he takes all the things he needs for a sacrifice and he goes to Mount Moriah and he puts, he bounds, binds uh, Isaac, puts him on the altar, he takes a knife and he's ready to sacrifice him and God stops him. And God provides the sacrifice, which is not Isaac. And he says, <clears throat> in effect, that Abraham has passed the test. Now I know you fear God. Now there's something else going on there too, because throughout uh, Genesis and in, in the New Testament, as it's reflected in the New Testament as well, Abraham is considered the great man of faith. So you've got the fact that he feared God here. That, that would be a principle, but it's also closely tied to uh, he was a man of faith. And um, Hebrews chapter 11 emphasizes that, that part of this. Um, so let's say for our purposes here that uh, Fear of the Lord based in faith is the principle in the story. What are possible applications? I'm, I'm open to hearing anybody give me one. What would be a possible application to today of this story? I guess, um, first of all, faith. Um, I mean, like you said, we don't know what uh, Abraham was feeling, but maybe he also was thinking, you know, God gave us this miracle child because um, Sarah and I were past the age of conceiving. Maybe he'll raise Isaac from the dead, or maybe we'll have another child or something like that. Um, so, but I certainly believe, obviously, um, definitely just having faith in God to do the impossible or what seems to be impossible. Um, and also just, you know, when you follow through with God's instructions, he's always going to provide for you. I think um, I remember reading that passage and, and, and I think, you know, just knowing that God provided that, I think it was a ram for the sacrifice because um, it was just a test. Um, and I think knowing that God will provide for you could be an application for us. Good. Obedience. Well, go ahead. Obedience. Obedience. Uh huh. Which sometimes people have almost contrasted faith and obedience as if they're totally separate from each other, and they're not. Obedience. True, true godly obedience is an act of faith. Uh, they're not separate. Faith shows itself by being obedient. And, and uh, that's, what, that's a, what Abraham was doing. He was showing his faith. We don't know all the ins and outs of it. Hebrews 11 does connect it with believing that God could uh, raise Isaac from the dead. Um, but... He had the faith to step out and do this, do the unbelievable. I mean, God had never offer, had never required human sacrifice. And here he's telling Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. That, that within itself is confusing. And the, the fact that this is the son of promise and he's about to obliterate the, the son of promise. Um, the whole thing's excruciating but it shows that he was willing out of faith 
he was willing to to obey and put it all on the line. And I think for us um, to realize that, I mean, sometimes, sometimes when you're reading in the Bible, you can read things that just are hard. Um, maybe in certain cases, it has to do with forgiving enemies. And it's a very specific enemy who did a terrible thing to you. Uh, you expect me to forgive them? Okay, yeah. Uh, and, 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 and sometimes we may find ourselves realizing that God, because of what, what he's revealed to us in his word, that he's expecting us to do something or believe something that seems totally absurd, totally crazy. But if it really is coming from God, then, then that's exactly what he's calling us to do. So faith, faith being the principle, notice there are a number of different applications that have to do with obedience, with trusting God, with believing after you, as you trust him and obey him, believing that he will provide even when from a human standpoint that doesn't seem that doesn't seem possible okay let's uh, another passage i think we'll go to matthew 6 for this one in the first 16 verses of matthew 6 this is part of the this is part of the sermon on the mount and in the in the first 16 verses there's a section there having to do with righteousness and depending on your translation jesus is saying in effect don't do your acts of righteousness or don't practice your righteousness before other people to be seen by them and all that wording is important he's not saying don't practice righteousness um he um, but 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 the key to understanding what he's arguing what he's arguing there is don't don't practice your righteousness in order to be seen approved honored by other people. It's a wrong focus. Then he get, then Jesus gives three illustrations of his point. And by the way, this teaching is aimed directly at the uh, the pharisees who loved m many of them apparently loved to practice their righteousness in front of other people so that people will say what great people they are but anyway there there's the, the there's the his basic idea is don't do your acts of righteousness before people to be seen by them then he gives three illustrations the first one has to do with giving to the needy the second one has to do with praying and the third has to do with fasting. In giving to the needy, what he's saying is, it's not that it's bad to give to the needy, but they were doing it in a way that they were making themselves look good. And Jesus says, give, yeah, give to people who are in need, but do it in a way that your right hand doesn't know what your left hand is doing. Um, don't, don't do it in to be seen by other people, but do it to be seen by God alone. Then his second illustration has to do with praying. And he says, that there are people out there who like to, who like to go into the synagogue and make a big show of praying. Uh, he says, but don't do that. When you pray, go in your closet, go in someplace private, other words. Um, so that uh, and and pray to God alone. Now, if you're if you're not careful, you could you could say public prayers are totally out, and that that's not his point. His point actually doesn't have to do with how public the prayer is, but the but the motivation. And he's getting at people whose motivation was to look good before other people. And he says the real motivation should be to look good before God. 
to please him with what we do. Then his third illustration has to do with fasting. He says, when you fast, in effect, don't make a big deal out of it. Don't make sure that everybody knows that you're fasting. But, uh, but, pre but present yourself to the world as if you're not fasting. So that no one in looking at you could tell that you're fasting. Um, and, and God who is in secret will see, will see what you've done. Okay, help me out here. What's the principle? We'll start out with that. What's the principle? If he's acting righteousness before God, not before people to be showy, to show off. Do your acts of righteousness before God and not before people to show off before them. Is that the way you worded it? Yeah. Sort of. Mm -hmm. That's good. Okay. Please go. What are some what are some possible applications? Well, they're the same thing. The applications would be the same as he gave, you know, the um Don't let everybody know how much you give or all the time you're giving to the church and you're doing all these good works and you know don't brag uh, about the things you're doing to be righteous before god does that make sense yeah i don't know if everybody could hear i don't know if the rest of you could hear that but the idea is today um we might not be doing exactly well, in principle, um, don't let people know how much you're giving. In in principle, uh, um, we can still give to the needy. We can still pray, of course, and we can still fast. And um, picking up on well, especially the first one of those, uh, the application that uh, that Kathy shared was. Don't uh, don't make a big deal of what you are doing, how much you are giving. Keep that uh, keep that confidential. Um, in effect, between you and God. And uh, don't. But you you know some of these things. I mean, if you're if you're doing if you're doing good things for other people, that's going to be known. But it, it, again, it gets back to motivation for us, I think. And you're not going around bragging about it, telling people, oh, I did this and I did that. That's true, but people will be aware of it. That's what I'm saying. Well, um, but, but, but it gets to motivation. And um, why are we motivated to do the things we do? Is it so that other people will say what a good person we are, how wonderful we are? Or are we doing it uh, to serve God and help other people? Also, as much as possible, if we can do our acts of righteousness, uh, incognito, if we can do it, if we can do it silently under the radar as much as possible, that 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 protects us from that that temptation to just do it so other people will. Say how wonderful we are. I think somebody else was speaking up. It might have been Canva. Uh, it was me. It was Linda. Oh, okay. I, I was going to say, uh, you you really said it. I was just going to say that whatever we do, we should do it to glorify God and not to glorify ourselves so that we can <laughs> be honored by men because that is going to be our reward. Uh, and that's all we get is that moment. But when we do it as unto the Lord, then the blessings go through e for eternity and uh, others are able to benefit uh, and God is glorified and not us. Well stated. Well said. 
I remember uh, Donald Miller, the old Donald Miller, not the newer one, uh, uh, said, "We can uh, we can do things." We can do things to please God and to glorify God, or we can do things to look good before other people. We must decide we can't have both. It, again, it gets at motivation. Why are we doing what we do? Amen. And, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jim, that's Chooks. Yes. Yeah, yeah uh, I just... I, 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 didn't, I didn't want to say anything with regards to that, but when you keep coming back to it, uh, you know, what motivates us to do what we do, it's very important for us to understand that there are some people, they do things, the right thing, but they do it for the wrong reasons. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, like, the, uh, I don't know if it's Kendra, who, what she said, whatever we have to do in the body of Christ, number one thing is to glorify his name. Yes, sir. it's to glorify God. Number one, whatever it is we have to do, if people recognize and they um, at some point recognize what we do, and they come and give us some motivation and you know uh, so en encourages us to do more. Yes, that is God speaking to them to kind of give us you know some heads up and you know make us to do more and to motivate us to even do more into the body of Christ. But the bottom line is, that is the one that is going to speak to people to come back, to give back to us, right? So if we have inside of us that this thing that I'm doing, I'm doing it to glorify God, it's very, very crucial and important for us to understand that because I've seen a lot of people, they come and say, oh, I'm, I want to do this, but it's because they want to try to get gains from it. A lot of people do that. I want to do this because I know at the end of the day, my, 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 God sees our heart. He sees what is inside of us before we even try to do it. And we cannot deceive him. We cannot mock him. So that's why I keep telling people, I say, okay, come on. If you're going to do this, number one thing in your heart should be to glorify his name. And, and it's, it, you know, it, it's, it's very important for us to have that understanding. So, you know, good, good point you're trying to make on there. Thanks. And piggybacking on what you just said, um, on one part of it. If we do the right thing for the wrong reason, it, it robs it of all its benefit for us. I mean, if we do the right thing for somebody else, well, they benefit from it, but, but we don't benefit, we don't benefit from it if we, if we're doing it for the wrong reason, we're not we're we're not getting God's pleasure out of what we're doing because we've done it for the wrong reason. And this can be very subtle, but it's really I think it's a I think it's a really important principle. And the way we apply it in uh, I mean it can have to do with with giving money, giving time, uh, teaching children doing something to, to help adults. I mean, it, there can be all kinds of things and, and we need to keep in mind that we've got, that we're wanting to do this to glorify and honor God um, and for his pleasure so that he will be pleased with what we did, not so that other people will be pleased. Now, if they are pleased, that's good, but that's not the motivation. Okay. So those are a couple of illustrations of how we do this. And, and there are other passages. I mean, all, all passages are going to be like this to some, to some degree. Um, I, uh, I'm trying to decide. I have some other passages that we could look at. But I think maybe that was enough to illustrate it. One of the things I did want to do is I wanted to, we're not going to go through all of them, but I wanted to look at some of the passages that you've done in exercises and also in the, uh, in the midterm, just to give you kind of my, my take on it. And I think especially since so many of you 
have worked on these that uh, it might be might be helpful and it'll be a little more extensive than what I could really do in in any uh, critique of the in critique of the lesson. So I I, I picked out a couple of these that I wanted to uh, take a little closer look at. One of the exercises was from um, John's second letter. And um, Uh, and and the exercise was to list the repeated words and phrases. In your opinion, which of these words and phrases are most important for the author's message? Why? And then how does the author describe the problem his first readers faced? So ju just some some of the things that I some of the things I did with this. I mean, Second John is a very short letter. It's just in uh, in your Bible. It's just thirteen verses, and yet there's a lot of uh, a, a lot of meaning in this. And um, let me read through it. And I want you to notice. Uh, I am going to make one change. I'm reading reading from the NIV, and I will make a change. You'll notice when I come to verse seven. One, one little change. Well, it's actually pretty big, but it seems small. The elder to the chosen lady and her children, whom I love in the truth. And not I only, but also all who know the truth. Because of the truth which lives in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son, will be with us in truth and love. It has given me great joy to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as the Father commanded us. And now, dear lady, I am not writing you a new commandment, but one uh, we have had from the beginning. I ask that we love one another, and this love that we, and, and, and this is love, that we walk in obedience to his commandments or commands. As you have heard from the beginning, his command is that you walk in love. Because many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch out that you do not lose what you have worked for but that you may be rewarded fully. Anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take him into your house or welcome him. Anyone who welcomes him shares in his wicked work. I have much more to write to you, but I do not want to use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to visit you and talk with you face to face so that our joy may be complete. The children of your chosen sister send their greetings. Okay, this is a, of course, is a letter. Um, first three verses are, are the greeting. He says who it's from, who it's to, um, says a little bit of, uh, about the people that he's writing it to, and then uh, gives uh, this prayer or this blessing in verse three. Then, then you have the body in verses four through 11, the body of the letter. And I'll say a little bit more about that shortly. Then in verses 12 and 13, there is a, um, there's a, uh, the conclusion. So three parts, greeting, body, and conclusion. In the body, well, first I'll start. Um, in repeated words and phrases, um, elect lady and elect sister at the beginning and the end of the book serve as brackets around the whole thing. Children is repeated 
uh, three times. Uh, love, four times. Truth, another four. Other words such as abides, will be with us, the Father, Jesus Christ, joy and rejoice, walk and walking, commanded, um, command, commandments, commandment, yeah, um, and so on, um, are, are things that, that, are that are repeated uh, throughout. Now, some things we can learn just by looking at uh, just by looking at uh, this uh, this letter, and um, some things are harder for us are harder for us to figure out, and I'll come to that. One of one of the uh, disputes has been over. Okay, who is the elder? Because he doesn't actually say he's John, but uh, tradition says that it was the apostle John, and it certainly fits with. Uh, the gospel, First John and Third John, and uh, I would say with the Book of Revelation as well. But more uh, more dispute has been over the idea of the chosen lady or the elect lady, depending on your translation, and her children, and then at the end, the children of your elect or chosen sister. So is the the dispute has been: Is this um, is this an individual? You've got this woman and her children, and then there are greetings that come from her sister, and, or or the children of her her, her chosen sister, or elect sister. Is that uh, are those two are those individuals we're talking about, or are or is that are those designations for the church? He's writing to a congregation. He's calling her, the, the congregation, a her, and the children would be the members. A and then at the end, the children of your chosen sister would be other Christians who are sending their greetings. I tend to think that that's what it is, but I'm not going to go into all that at this point. But in the body of the letter itself, in verses four through six, you have uh, an appeal to walk in truth and love. In, in the list, truth and love are, are repeated over and over again. In, uh, I mean, this is a short letter, and, and yet it, it's striking how often the, the, those are repeated. Um, so in verses four through six, you have this repetition. He speaks of walking in truth, he says, uh, uh, I ask that we love one another. This is what love is. Walk, uh, it is walking in obedience to his commands. And then, um, and then he says, as you've heard from the beginning, his command is that you walk in love. And that from the beginning is, pr and when you link that up in, with verse 5, a new commandment, um, he, he's, he's linking both of those with the Gospel of John, I think, chapter 13, verses 34 and 35, and also chapter 15, verse 12, where Jesus says he gives this new commandment that they love one another. And uh, John is making, I think, a reference to that. So you've got truth and love. We'll come back to those. Then in verse 7, you might notice that the change I made in the NIV was the NIV says many deceivers who have not acknowledged Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. I added the word because. The reason I added the word because is because that's what's in the original. For some inexplicable reason, the NIV chose not to translate the word. They just left it out. The ESV puts in the word for. I kind of like the word because, but for will do. Um, but whether whether it's before or because, it's pointing back to what he's just said. All this emphasis on truth and love is is there in the letter because there are these many deceivers that he talks about. And just by looking closely at the at the wording, 
we can we can get a hint or we can get at least a general idea of the problem that he's dealing with. There are these deceivers. Now, well, what do we know about these deceivers? They do not acknowledge Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh. That wording, unless you have some prior experience with it, that wording's unusual. I mean, if he said they're denying that Jesus is the Christ, that we'd understand that. Uh, they're denying that Jesus is the Son of God. We would understand that. But when he says they're denying that Jesus Christ came in the flesh, that's unusual. I, I mean, I think they should strike us as being a little unusual without some help in figuring out what's going on. Um, and we'll come back to that. But he says they've gone out into the world. He says that such a person, the ones he's just described, is the deceiver and the Antichrist. It's interesting that uh, as much play as the term Antichrist gets in religious circles today, in the New Testament, Antichrist is used by just one author, John. He's the only author that uses that term. And he uses it in 1 John and 2 John only. You would, given, given what you hear about it, you would think it would be in the book of Revelation. It is not. When Paul talks about the man of sin in 2 Thessalonians, he does not use the term Antichrist. As I said, it's not used anywhere else except in John. And John, notice what he says, that any person who's doing what he's describing here is the Antichrist. And uh, in 1 John, he says, you've heard that, You've heard that Antichrist is coming. I'm telling you, they're all right here. So um, Antichrist is literally someone who, who uh, displaces or um, seeks to uh, seeks to downgrade the Christ in some way. And, and, and we get some insight into that when he says uh, they don't acknowledge that he has come in the flesh. Um, see, this is a place at which our study probably, we're going to end up with a question. Unless we already have some prior experience with it, we're going to read this and we're going to have a question about who are these deceivers that he calls the Antichrist. And what is it that they're saying exactly? And um, we can be helped by going to 1 John, but there are other studies out there, and we get into some historical kinds of things that can help us give some background to this. So this is one of the advantages, one of the benefits of using other, other books. What, what we'll find is, Historically, this is outside the New Testament, although it's reflected in the New Testament. Outside the New Testament, by the end of the first century and early then in the second century, there were, there were a group of people who claimed to be Christian, but they were teaching some very unchristian things. Today, they're known as Gnostics. Um, Gnostics took more than one form. It's sort of like modern-day existentialists. They're all over the map. And Gnostics took different forms. But, but what they agreed on was that bodies or flesh, our flesh, is bad. It's just e evil to start with. And they would make a distinction between the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament. In their minds, there were actually two gods. You've got the God of the Old Testament, who's an evil God, and you've got the God of the New Testament, who's a good God. The evil God is the creator. Bodies are bad. Um, the good God comes to us in Jesus Christ, but since bodies are bad, Jesus Christ cannot have a body. 
they, they don't acknowledge that he came in the flesh. Okay, bodies are bad, so the Christ can't have a body. At that point, there were at least two forms of it. One form was, okay, the, the Christ spirit came on a man by the name of Jesus. Jesus was not the Christ, but the Christ spirit took him over and stayed with him all through his ministry and then left him at the cross. Okay, that's one. Uh, that was one view of a group of Gnostics. Another view was, since bodies are bad and the Christ can't have a body, Jesus was a phantom. He didn't really have a body. He just appeared to be a human being, but he wasn't. But you see, either one of those, either, either one of those strikes at the heart of Christianity that says that God became a man. That God came in the world, came into the world in Jesus Christ, and that he took on flesh. And therefore he was tempted as we're tempted and, and, and Jesus died on the cross for our sins as our substitute. We deserve to die. He died in our on our behalf. So um, we need some help with that is what I'm saying. That, that's where some of this other comes in. We can go so far, we can see it and see that they're teaching something that's, that John is terribly upset about. He calls them deceivers. He calls them the Antichrist. He says that they aren't teaching that Christ came in the flesh. But without some help, we're probably not going to be able to figure out exactly what that is. And we don't have to know all the ins and outs just to know that they're striking at the very nature of Christ in what they're saying. So having put this together, my, my, uh, my take on it is that the most important uh, repeated words are truth and love, and that, uh, and in that order. Because uh, what's at stake here is the truth about Jesus Christ. He speaks of how we love the truth. The truth abides in us. Grace, mercy, and peace are with us in truth and love. We are to walk or live in truth, the truth that we were that God commanded us to walk in or live in. We are to buy, abide in the true truth, true teachings, the truth teachings, and and when we do that, the truth abides in us. But but the antichrist deceiver denies the truth about Jesus Christ coming in the flesh. So the, the, uh, the issue has to do with the truth and specifically the truth having to do with uh, Jesus Christ. Love then grows out of this truth about Christ. We love as Jesus Christ loved. And if, if, if what the apostles in the early church have always taught about Jesus and who he was. If it's not true, then, um, then it makes no difference whether we love like Jesus or not. But if it is true, then he is the source of truth, but he's also the source of true love uh, in the universe. Um, so we've already talked about the, the problem that he faced. It was a problem of false teachers who were out circulating in the churches, con claiming to be Christians, but denying the very nature, uh, the very nature of Jesus Christ. So hopefully that's kind of an illustration of the sort of things um, that we've been doing with these uh, with these texts, and also showing that there are there are things we can get from other books. Um, we could have gone to Philemon, and I've mentioned this before. Philemon, you can go through it and you can get, a, I think, a very 
I think you can get a very good picture of um, of of what Paul was asking Philemon to do, and the attitude he wanted Philemon to have toward Onesimus. But as I I think I've mentioned before, but what we don't get simply by reading the letter is we don't get the knowledge that Paul, Philemon, Onesimus all had about slavery. We, we will tend to impose whatever ideas we have. And in, in the US, those ideas are going to be shaped by slavery in the late 1700s, early 1800s, and so on in the United States. But they're not exactly the same. Slavery in the in the ancient world was not a unique institution. It was widespread. Virtually all nations had slaves. And 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 slavery in the Roman Empire, for instance, had nothing to do with race at all. Most of the slaves were Caucasian. They became slaves because they sold themselves into slavery for bad debts, but especially because they were on the losing side of a war. And they were part of a, an army that was defeated and they were made into slaves. Also, uh, slavery, slavery in the Old South, um, there were actually laws against educating the slaves. Now, there were some masters who did it anyway, but they were actually breaking the law when they did it. And the, I think the rationale was that if the slaves became educated, they would become dangerous and dissatisfied. And who knows, if they become educated and can read, then they're going to read something called the Constitution about all men being created equal. But in the Roman Empire, many of the slaves were more educated than their masters and were used to, uh, very often were used to educate the children and also were put into certain professions. They were still slaves, but they were put, put into certain pr professions that took um, education and learning. Uh, also, in the Roman Empire, the, the Romans were very nervous about runaway slaves. Most of us have probably heard of Spartacus. Spartacus led a slave revolt uh, against the Roman Empire. Now, the slave revolt was put down but it was a huge revolt, and it and it was showed real danger to the empire. Also, there, there's always the the fear among slaveholders in the Roman Empire, not just of a revolt, but of being murdered in their beds by their slaves. And and so, a slave who runs away was seen by the Romans as a huge danger. The picture we get in Philemon is that uh, Onesimus ran away. The implication is that he took some of Philemon's stuff when he left, probably to finance his escape. He went so often as is the case, I mean, think about it. You're a runaway slave and you want to be, you want to get lost in a crowd. If you're out in a small community, you're going to stand out. Who are you? Where did you come from? Okay. So it makes sense you would go to the biggest city you could find, which in, in finally was probably Rome. There are some who would argue maybe um, Ephesus, but I would I, I I would contend for Rome. Rome was the largest city in the Roman Empire, and you just had a lot of people there. It would be easy to go to Rome and get lost in the crowd. 
And uh, so he goes and he gets lost in the crowd. Now, in some way, he becomes connected with Paul. The Apostle Paul is in prison. And, and the implication in the letter is that somehow he became connected, whether he went looking for Paul or just happened on Paul, that uh, Paul speaks of Onesimus as be becoming his child in his imprisonment. So the picture is Onesimus became a Christian under the ministry of Paul during Paul's imprisonment. Then Paul sends him home because Philemon is a Christian and now Onesimus is a Christian and he wants to make sure that things are right between them. Also, again, with the Romans, a runaway slave is a huge danger. And masters had the right to do anything to that runaway slave that they wanted. They could punish them in any way. They could put them to death. And so Paul sends Onesimus back, and he, he really bases it on Philemon's character. This may seem strange to us, but, I mean, read the letter real closely. He's, he's got a high opinion of Philemon's character. And what he reveals in the letter is that he's returning Onesimus now not as a slave, but better than as a slave, as a beloved brother. And the, the letter shows us that in Christ, human relationships are uh, transformed. For, uh, for a slave and his master to now be family, is 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 a, is the work of Jesus Christ and the work only of Jesus Christ. Brother Jim, would you say that's the principle then of the book? Yes, I, I would say you can find more than one principle in Philemon, but uh, the I, I would say the principle is this revolutionary power of Jesus Christ to transform relationships. And let me say. Sometimes it's sometimes people have said, why doesn't Paul somewhere in his letters tell the slaves, you know, throw off your chains and and so on? Well, in the Roman Empire, all that was, was bloodbath. But what Paul does in this letter, I think, what you've got, think think about what he's saying in the letter. If people take seriously what he says in the letter, he's destroyed slavery. But rather than trying to destroy it from top down, he's destroyed it from inside. Because if slaves and masters begin to see each other as brothers and sisters, call it whatever you want to, slavery anymore. And um, and in the end, slavery was destroyed because of the very principles that were being taught uh, in this book and other parts of the New Testament. Uh, that was what, in, in the end, in the Western world, that's what destroyed slavery. Uh, it, it, it seems like an indirect approach, but... Um, but over time, it, it has been very effective. I could say more about that, but again, I want to illustrate there are certain things we can get from the book just by reading it, just by reading it and looking at the repeated words and phrases and the structure of it. Again, this is Philemon's another letter with, a, with an introduction of body and a conclusion. Um, and, oh yeah, another, oh, this is too good for me to pass up in Philemon. So my love here. Um, in Philemon, there's a little phrase which is easy to miss, but which is, I think, it's just wonderful. Um, verse 7, 
He speaks, he speaks of Philemon's love. He says, it gives me great joy because you have refreshed the hearts of the saints. His very presence and his, his work in the church just refreshes people. Okay. You have refreshed the hearts of the saints. Then drop down to verse 12. I am sending him, that is Onesimus, who is my very heart, note the wording, back to you. Then drop down a little farther, verse 20. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you. Refresh my heart in Christ. What he said to Philemon is, you are the kind of person who refreshes the hearts of the saints. You're known for that. You do that. Onesimus is my very heart. Refresh my heart. How can you turn somebody like that down? Okay. <laughs> He has now connected himself with Onesimus. Onesimus is his very heart, and he asked Philemon to refresh his heart. It's subtle, but but I think it's it's there, and um, so we can get those kinds of things, and it's really exciting get those kinds of things from the letter. But it helps for us, for instance, in the case of Philemon, it helps if we know something about the Roman Empire, and specifically if we know something about slavery in the Roman Empire, for instance, how jittery the, the masters were when slaves ran away, and what they what Philemon had a legal right to do, but, but Paul is calling on him. In effect, what he's saying is, you've got the higher right of giving up your right. Which app has application for all of us, doesn't it? We, we have the higher right of giving up our rights for the good of the kingdom of God and for the good of other people. And uh, that's, something to, that's something to meditate on. Anyway, we, um, it's time to close out. Um, I will be happy to um, take questions, but I, I'll close out at this point. And if you want to st stay around and you have comments or questions, I'll be happy to uh, uh, entertain those for a while. But let's uh, pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the opportunity to, to find in your word that are meant to always be working in our lives. And um, Father, we ask that you would help us to be good stewards of your word and that you would help us to be honest and genuine in finding how your word applies to us in our everyday ongoing lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Oh, there will be homework, which I will be sending out to you. I already tell you it's going to be uh, it'll be from third John and will involve the reporters questions. I have a question, uh, Jim, about uh, missing last class. I couldn't uh, get I didn't have the link. I was one of those who couldn't get on, but I was just wondering, I looked for the YouTube video of last week's class and I can't find it. Is it on? Where is it located? Did you not get did you not get the link that I sent out for the YouTube class? Yeah. No, I didn't. I don't, unless I missed it in my emails. I, I That's don't. possible. There is another possibility because Molly who couldn't be here this evening um, also did not re said she didn't receive it. And what, I, what I'd suggest to you, I, I don't mind sending it out again. In fact, I'll send out, I'll send out all the links this time rather than just sending the link for this one. I'll send out all of them um, for the semester. But what I would suggest that you do and maybe do on an ongoing basis if, if you don't seem to receive things from me, mm -hmm. check your email junk. Okay. I, will. Sometime, I don't know why, but Molly's Molly said she hadn't received it. I said, check your junk and it was there. OK, I'll check it and see. So sometimes um, I don't know why they would think I'm spam. I don't but, know why that's not right. They shouldn't think you're spam. 
<laughs> Jim, I, but I, I will send it. I will send it out again. But do check junk because if it's being sent there, then if it happened once, it could happen other times too. I'm afraid. Okay. Jim, I'll, if if she I'll subscribed check. to SHBI online classes, it's real easy to find. Well, I looked on. I looked at. I am subscribed. To it, but I couldn't find the one for last week. I watched it. <laughs> Did you? And it's on there. Does it have the what date is on it? Well, whatever last whatever last Monday was is the date that's on it. I'll I'll check it again because I no, I, I, I put it on on Friday, depending oh. on what else is going on in my life at that point. But I um I always. I always try to get it on on Friday, and I believe I always have so far. And uh, I put the date I put on the class is is the date the class was given. Now I don't know if I don't know if YouTube changes it to the date that I put it down there or what they do with it. But the date I put on it is the date of the class. The date of the class. Okay, yeah. I'll I'll look for it, and if I can't find it, I'll just uh, text you or or email you uh but i should be able to find it find it but i just couldn't yeah let, okay. let, let me know because if we're if we're I, I have no idea why we have started having problems with not uh, receiving these or those going to junk mail i just don't i don't know why i don't know okay. why that's happening okay thanks a lot thank you jim uh in that in last week's lesson, there were in the discussion of the river, and you were talking about uh, how wide or narrow the river is, and you were comparing Old Testament to New Testament. Yes. You, you said something about the distance is greater in the Old Testament, but uh, even though the New Testament differences are not exactly like our world that they can be deceptive can you speak more to that well we 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 may think that we're closer to i mean obviously let me put it this way obviously when you read the much of the old testament you're reading a in a world that we know nothing about i mean if right. it weren't in the bible we probably wouldn't know very much about it it's it's really a different world um when you read in the New Testament, at least we're a little more familiar with it because this is this is the what should I say the beginnings of the Western world, right? And also in the New Testament, we're talking uh, after the Gospels, we're talking about Christians under the New Covenant. That's okay. We can relate to that. But the reason I say, it, having said all that. It can still be deceptive because there there are certain differences there that we have no par no close parallel to. So, for instance, I'll just give a couple of for instances. Um, one would be um, in uh, in First Corinthians about meat sacrifice to idols. That's just not part of our experience. But it was very much a part of their experience, especially uh, as non-Christians, uh, Gentiles who had become Christians. Because as Gentiles, they would have been pagan religions, and they were familiar with pagan practices and pagan sacrifices. So now they become Christians in Corinth. They're, uh, they're no longer participating in the pagan sacrifices. Um, but they go to a dinner party and somebody says, oh, this, this meat was sacrificed to idols. And what that means is when, when meat was brought to the temple, and it's also true of the Jewish temple as well, we, we th may think that, that that meat was all burned up as a sacrifice. It wasn't. Um, it was Part of the meat was given to, uh, was given to the priests for their support. And in pagan uh, pagan temples, they got so much meat that they couldn't eat all of it. So what they do? They sold it to the meat markets that surrounded the temples. So people would go to the meat markets and get choice cuts of meat 
that had been sacrificed to idols, sacrificed to the, the gods. Um, so this, this causes a dilemma for uh, many of the Gentile Christians who say, can I eat that meat? Or if I go to a dinner party where somebody else is serving that meat, what do I do? We don't have that background. That issue is not our issue. Now, I think I think in I think I think in principle, uh, I think the, the principles uh, there are principles there that apply to us, but um, but the specifics don't. So, okay, they were Christians. We're Christians. They were under the new covenant. We're under the new covenant. They they they're devoted followers of Jesus. We're devoted followers of Jesus. And yet they were facing a problem that's not exactly like ours. Or this evening when we talked about Gnosticism, we have some things that are pretty close to it, and there are modern day Gnostics, but most of it probably is a little outside of most of our experience. Or one more example. The Apostle John writes the book of Revelation. Background to the book of Revelation is the church is being persecuted, persecuted by the Roman Empire. But what John says is persecution has already started, but it's going to get a lot worse. Okay. We have not known the kind of persecution that he's talking about. There are people in the world who have known that sort of persecution, but in North America, we haven't known it. Now, that, does that mean we don't face any persecution? No, it doesn't mean that. Um, because more and more throughout North America, and we saw it a lot, a lot in Canada, and now we're seeing it more in the U.S., uh, there, there are elements in, in culture um, and sometimes in the government that want to marginalize Christianity. It's interesting, it's not an even playing field because they don't want to marginalize Islam or Buddhism or Hindu, but you call it Christian and they want it, they want it out of bounds. Um, but that's still not the same as what, as what was going on with the Romans. So the, the, uh, there, were, there was more than one persecution that was taking place with the early church you had persecution of Jews by Jews. Jewish unbelievers uh, persecuted Christian Jewish believers. Okay, so you had that tension from the very beginning. Then, as long as, as, long as the governmental authorities thought that Christians were just an offbeat type of Jew, the Christians were under the umbrella of protection that was given to the Jews by the Romans. Because the, the Jews were considered, a, okay, they're somewhat offbeat, but they're, they, they get a particular protection because they're, they're just odd, okay? <laughs> but we, we will give them a certain amount of protection. And so Christians were protected under that umbrella until the Romans figured out these aren't Jews. Christians are another religion altogether, and they're not under the, uh, that umbrella. And so as time went on, first you have, which we see in First Peter, you have the kind of persecution that took place not because of the government. The government wasn't, didn't have anything to do with it. It was... Uh, neighbors, former friends, neighbors, relatives who thought that your Christian faith was uh, offensive or just weird. What's the matter with you? You don't know how to have fun anymore. Okay. And so they would, uh, th they would attack you individually, verbally or physically or slander you or do whatever they could to marginalize you. So you had that 
And eventually what followed that was governmental persecution, and that's what's reflected in uh, the book of Revelation, that it's already started, but it's going to get much worse. Well, that's not been our experience. It may be our experience one day, but it's not been our experience thus far. Being, being marginalized isn't the same. Although I will say, if you ever have had non-Christian, former friends, associates, or uh, people you work with who are antagonized by your Christian faith, then read First Peter again. Jim. Yes. Uh, I think one of the one of the things that some people have said is that good interpreters find cultural equivalents. And I think what the problem that that I had, and I'm sure these others could face as well, is that is that what is it in that text that that we can identify and we can understand, but then what is it in the receptor text or, or the receptor uh, culture? That, that we can communicate that reality to those to those people. My my favorite example is is the schoolmaster in Galatians three, as you as you probably know. And and to make a long story short, my good friend Hugo McCord always said, "Well, the best cultural equivalent for that is a school bus driver." And and so I always thought that was an amusing way to illustrate that point. That that the good interpreters have to find the cultural equivalent, particularly in, that we're communicating to, in the, it, that, it, that is equivalent to the ancient culture. Okay, good. Thank you. Well, I, I do have another example that I could give that might be helpful. Um, and it, I think it goes along with what you just said, somewhat at least. In um, Colossians, um, and I haven't read your paper yet, uh, Kirk, but so uh, I'll, I'll be playing my hand out on, on, on what I'm saying here. In Colossians, I haven't said it yet. <laughs> oh, in, in Colossians, you have the so-called um, Colossian heresy, and it's been highly debated as far as what that is. Some people say it's Judaism. Some people have said it was Gnosticism. Or, uh, some kind of, or some kind of pagan religion, um, I, can, I, I have come to the conclusion, and I, I, I know there, there's really good people in all those camps as far as how they view it, um, but I've come to the conclusion that it's syncretism uh, because the, the elements, trying to put them all together, that, that's part of the problem. When you look at Colossians, there are a bunch of different things that don't seem to fit with each other. And um, so I've come to the conclusion is they don't, they don't seem to fit with each other because they don't, except in the Colossians' own minds. Yeah, amen, amen. That is, that's right. Okay, good. Um, and I didn't even read your paper yet. Uh, but... but um, so, so the conclusion I came to is you've got, you've got these people who were Gentiles, they've become Christians, but they've gotten confused. And so they've taken a little Judaism, a little of their paganism from the past, and a little Christianity, and they've mixed them together. And so without, probably without consciously intending to, they've brought Jesus down. Um, they've mixed Christianity with these other things and come up with kind of an odd uh, thing. Now, if that's somewhere near the truth, do, you, do any of you know anybody today that's taken a little Christianity and a little philosophy and a little Eastern religion and mixed them together? I've known people like that. And we don't I, have I, time to list all the options. Yeah. And, and there, so, so, see, that's a case where I do think in some ways, even though the culture in the first century was different from ours, in some ways we are now closer to that culture 
than maybe in any time in history down to this point. I think, Jim, that the guy that preaches in the basketball arena on I-59 South probably has come close to that. Whatever the culture is thinking or whatever it's saying, I'm going to select out of the out of the New Testament those things that agree with it, and that way I can get more followers, I can get a bigger place, I can have I have more popularity. But don't preach on certain things because that's repentance or or other things that are diametrically opposed to the prevailing culture. And I think that's what that's what we we, we probably need to understand our culture, and 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 speak to those issues. I know Paul did and John did. These guys all knew what the culture was and they could speak to it and refute it if it needed to be. <laughs> That's what I always thought was good. Yeah, the uh, yeah, it's interesting. Culture is, um, I don't want to put it, culture is culture. Culture is uh, neutral in the sense of Human culture, I'll put it that way. In a sense, we could speak of our culture in Christ, and that would be different. But but uh, human cultures all have some elements in them that are positive and some that are negative. And, um, and, and we need to be very, we need to be very aware of that. Um, in Acts 17, when the Apostle Paul was in Athens, he went to uh, a meeting of the Areopagus, which was kind of a philosopher's society. And um, if you if you look at his his sermon there, it is a master. It's masterful in communication. He he starts with where they are. He says, "As I was walking around, I noticed this." Uh, well, I perceive you're very religious, and, and I noticed this uh, altar to an unknown God. Well, that God that you admit that you don't know is the one I want to tell you about. And he starts out, and he uses their language, the language of especially of Stoic philosophers. But he, but he is driving to a point. He, he is refuting their paganism, and finally he gets to, to a place where he speaks of uh, the, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And at that point, that is so absurd to Greek philosophers that they cut him off. But he's gotten a hearing. He's gotten a hearing by connecting in, both in concepts and in um, language with, what, with their culture. But then driving to the point that they need to hear and that will not fit with their culture. Anyway, that's kind of a ways off. Are there other questions or comments? Jim? Yeah. Uh, something I've noticed about that same scripture reference passage is that he used their idols to address the the problem, but he didn't take their idols into the Christian worship. Correct. Yeah. It's yeah. Just like I, you, I, it's I, like you said. You he confronted that idolatry. He started with it. He started with that, but ultimately, this this is where preaching and teaching in in, in the Lord's church today becomes exceedingly difficult for some people. Because they don't want to, they don't want to confront these issues in the culture that are, in fact, diametrically opposed to what Jesus and Paul taught, and others as well. Yeah, um, in Acts, what I was, uh, hopefully, I was, hopefully, I got it across that what was masterful, I think, Paul started with where they were. He perceived that they were very religious, which was true. And and he used the, the very fact that they um, they had an altar to an unknown God admit uh, was an admission that they didn't they didn't know it all. 
and that maybe there was a God they didn't know about. And he says, that's the one I'm going to tell you about, the one you don't know about. And, um, and, and also look at what he does. He uses, he uses their language. A lot of what he says in there at the beginning, especially, could come right out of a stoic philosopher handbook. I mean, he, he uses their language and <clears throat> concepts that they could agree to. Biblical, but, 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 but he, he couches it in language that they, they could agree to. But he is driving to this point because what they, they need to know that, well, as he says, the God of the universe isn't served by men's hands as if he needed anything. Um, but beyond that, what he was wanting to get to is Jesus and uh, Jesus death, burial and resurrection. Uh, they, they need to be confronted by the reality of God becoming a human being. And um, as I said, the resurrection, the resurrection for Greeks um, of that period were was absurd. They they simply couldn't visualize a resurrection. Uh, they believed in the immortality of the soul, but, but they did not believe in resurrection. And even in the immortality of the soul. Uh, the world to come was not a happy place for them. When Paul elsewhere says um, they're without hope, that's absolutely the correct way to describe the, the, that world. And um, he's going to he, he's driving to give them hope. And and while I, I think that's right, he he doesn't bring he doesn't bring the idols in. But he, um, but he uses, he uses what elements he can to start the conversation. And you'll notice at the end, while most of them, while most of them rejected what he had to say, there were some that were attracted and continued, continued conversations with him. Okay. Good night, Jim. Thank you, brother. I love you. Love you, man. Bye-bye. Good night, Jim. Thank you. Good night.